This is Free to Exchange, the show where free-thinking scholars, free markets, and, ironically, free public television all meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. On today's show, we're first talking oil, gas, and energy. Then, we're going to discuss recent U.S. housing bubble and the Great Recession. These might seem like unrelated topics, but we'll find some common themes. On the second half of the show, I have a special treat. We'll be joined by Nobel Prize winning economist Vernon Smith. But first, I'm happy to have with me Dr. Rob Bradley joining me to discuss energy markets. Rob is the CEO and founder of the Houston-based Institute for Energy Research. He's the author of seven books, most re recently, From Edison to Enron, Energy Markets and Political Strategies. Prior to founding his institute, Rob was the Corporate Director for Public Policy Analysis at Enron. Rob, welcome. Thanks for coming. Good to be here, Ben. All right. Well, I want to talk energy with you, but, but first, as I was just introducing you, I'm saying that you used to work as a policy analyst for Enron, and this shows about free markets and capitalism here, and a lot of people, if they remember, I guess it was a little while ago, so maybe I should have you tell us what, what Enron was, why it was in the news, but then a lot of people think that's a shining example of capitalism and greed, and that's why the whole system what doesn't work. What right. can you tell us about that? Well, uh, Enron was considered one of the nation's leading companies, rated by Fortune magazine and others. It was everyone's favorite in the 1990s. Part of the new economy, branched out from energy to broadband to a variety of areas. It was everyone's favorite company. The stock price went up, up, up. And then the company that everyone thought was the best company suddenly imploded quickly. And then when all the autopsies were done on Enron, there were a number of books written. Um, the, uh, the, the standard interpretation was capitalist greed. We didn't have enough regulation. If we only had more regulation, we could have prevented a lot of the deceit that Enron uh, went through in order to fool everyone. Was that story right? Well, the textbook interpretation is almost exactly wrong because uh, Enron's core competency was particularly in energy, which was very regulated, and Enron was a master of political capitalism rather than free market capitalism. Most of the profit centers at Enron were directly uh, dependent on government intervention, special government favor. Mm -hmm. Enron got very big into wind, into solar, into so-called energy efficiency uh, through a lot of government subsidies. Uh, Enron was a leading recipient of uh, taxpayer support for international energy projects. So they were a great profitable country, a company as basically a welfare queen. It was a, uh, very much so. So what enabled Enron was the government side of the mixed economy. So when they say we needed more regulation of Enron, it's kind of just Pollyanna-ish to think somehow these regulators would have behaved differently than all the other government agencies that were already helping Enron? Right, but there's even more to the story. Uh -oh. Because of our tax system being politicized, because of our accounting system being politicized, and out in California they had an electricity market that was very regulated. Enron was a master at gaming complex regulatory structures. Mm. So Enron's best and brightest were figuring out ways around the regulation to make artificial profits. And that was a big part of the story about how the company, they were reporting all these profits, mm -hmm. but they weren't getting the cash flow. All and right. that gets back to the very politicized accounting system, which is a uh, subject for another day. Well, this makes a lot of sense, but we need to talk about oil and gas and, and wind before you leave the show here. Sure. So, you know, we've been hearing for years, right? We've, you know, we hit peak oil, we're running out of oil, it's a depletable resource. What's going on with all that? It seems like around Texas, we're always hearing about new oil now. Right. Well, uh, for most of the history of the oil industry, which dates from about the 1860s, the story has been it is a fixed resource. We are depleting it with our production and consumption, and prices are going to have to go up for oil and oil products. Uh, but really the opposite has been true, that in a free market with market incentives, since the ultimate resource is human ingenuity, that we can produce more oil and gas than we can actually consume. And the story, if you look at prices in free market periods, 
it has been a buyer's market rather than a seller's market. Now, we have had instances where we've had oil shortages, but it's been during World War I, World War II, in the 1970s, and what did those three uh, periods have in common? Mm, let me guess. Uh, not free market prices. Price controls and allocation controls. Mm -hmm. So it's actually government intervention that creates the shortages and then people get in their minds, oh, it's a depletable resource, we're running out of it. Well, you know, people, somebody's watching this show and they're like, okay, that's all well and good. But come on, Rob, there's only so much of that stuff in the ground. What do you say to them? I say there's an ocean of BTUs beneath our feet. And the more we discover, the more we find that there's more to be discovered. That human ingenuity, the ultimate resource, is not a depleting resource, it's an expanding resource. And remember, resources, all minerals, oil, gas, coal, copper, resources really come from the mind and not the ground. Right, oil was just some yucky substance before we found a use for it, right? Right. Um, so, you know, there's a, a, a two-word answer I usually give to somebody when they say that we're running out of something. The first word starts with B, the second one starts with S. I'm not gonna say it because we're in polite company here. Uh, but the reason, of course, is because we have market prices, right? As long as we have private property in it, if we were running out of the oil, its price would start going up and people would find substitutes, wouldn't they? Right. Uh, there's an old adage, the cure for high oil prices so is high oil prices. prices. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for things like tuna, this doesn't work because people don't own the tuna that are running around right. the ocean right now. So the right. high prices there, we might actually run out of that. But as long as you can privately own it, right. you're never going to run out of it. So that leads to a question about switching then. So a lot of people say, oh, we need more sustainable energy. And they'll say, well, we need these wind farms. We see them all over Texas. In fact, right. while we're recording today, it's, it's pretty windy out there in West Texas. What's the economics behind this wind energy? Does this make sense now? Renewable energies, um, remember, in most of mankind's history, the market share of renewable energies was 100%. <laughs> okay? Uh, and renewable energy is really an inferior energy, or energies, because when fossil fuels came, coal, oil, natural gas, you have a very dense uh, energy that is really the sun's work over millions of years versus the very dilute flow that comes from the wind or the falling water or solar. Mm. So uh, the energy density is why fossil fuels have such a high market share and why government intervention, special favor, is required for projects like wind farms. So wind farms wouldn't pass the market test without subsidy? Uh, it is, the wind industry is an entirely government dependent crony industry, and there's not many of them. There's defense contractors, and then there's really the wind industry. It would completely disappear. It is the perfect, imperfect energy because wind produces electricity, but yet it's intermittent. Mm -hmm. So you can't have really wind. What you have to do is to have the wind, the uh, kilowatt hours from wind come in, and it's joined by natural gas in order for the lights to stay on. So it's really wind gas. Mm. And so if you get rid of wind, which you don't need, uh, we would have a much more efficient uh, energy system, and we'd have a better environment too. Yeah. And so, I mean, the market does give us wind energy in like really weird situations, right, where the fixed cost of, of getting to them would be really high. So if like you have a hut on top of a mountain, right. you put a little wind turbine up there or something, or if you're on a sailboat, you can't yeah. like run a power cord to it. Sure, it's a, it's a but, niche energy, and so is solar, off the grid. Right. Off the grid, if you can't plug it in, you don't need it. And I'm going to guess then the market for off-the-grid energy has probably been distorted by pushing so much of it to be on-grid wind and solar. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's another issue. But the key thing to remember is that off-the-grid solar wind, they're starter energies. Mm -hmm. And they, that's what you start with. Then you'll go to fossil fuels as you, as you grow. So the one we haven't talked about yet, and we've got just under two minutes left, gas. Gas price, natural gas prices are, are really low, and it seems like we're finding more of this stuff all the time. And I've heard that we're not allowed to export it even from the United States. What's going on with natural gas? And how important is that here in Texas? Well, uh, natural gas is back to a seller's market as it usually is. Gas prices were uh, three, four times higher than they are today under price controls, which mm -hmm. is a, uh, you take some 
explaining because you think price controls keeps prices down. Actually, price controls <laughs> end up uh, increasing prices. But we do need to export now that the United States is a, uh, one of the powers of the world with natural gas, but the environmental movement now is saying we can't burn this, it's bad for the environment, we got to keep it in the ground and therefore we're going to block exports of natural gas, coal and oil. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for joining us today and talking about these important issues. Thank you, Ben. Free to Exchange is a joint project of Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and Texas Tech Public Media. More information is available at fmi.ttu.edu. In the blink of an eye, the world has changed. 30 years have come and gone. In the blink of an eye, it will be 2043. Each new generation makes its own history. And a new generation of Frontline will be here to tell it. Frontline. Thought-provoking journalism wherever and whenever you find us. Welcome back. Joining me now is Dr. Vernon Smith. Dr. Smith is a professor of economics at Chapman University School of Business and School of Law. He's the 2002 co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work that established laboratory experiments as a tool in empirical economic analysis. Boy, that's a mouthful. We're going to talk to Dr. Smith today about the recent U.S. recession, which, not accidentally, is related to the theme of his new book, Rethinking Housing Bubbles, the role of households and bank balance sheets. Dr. Smith, welcome. Great to be here, Ben. Thank well, you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thrilled to have you here to, to talk about this important topic. Uh, but let's start off for our viewers in Texas here. You, you won the Nobel Prize for your work in creating experimental economics. Yes. What is experimental economics? Do you experiment on economies? How does this work? Well, we, I started out primarily doing experiments in markets. And I went, to, my first appointment was at Purdue University. And uh, I was teaching principles of economics. And I realized that there was nothing in my education that enabled me to understand the connection between economic theory, supply and demand theory, mm -hmm. theory of markets, and what people actually do in markets, the decisions they make day by day. Uh, so I decided that at the beginning of the next semester, I would be, uh, when uh, I was teaching principles, I would start out and in the first, with the first class, I would do an experiment and they were not yet contaminated by economic theory. They wouldn't, didn't know any economics. They would be completely naive. And so I created a, uh, I, there, there were buyers and sellers, and by assigning values to the buyers, costs to the sellers, with the understanding that they would earn the difference, mm -hmm. the buyers would earn the difference between the value I gave them and the price they pay in the market and the sellers would earn the difference between the price at which they sold and their lowest price willingness to sell, which we call the cost. And so that's exactly like people, we imagine people in markets, you see, why do you, why do you pay $100 per pair of shoes? You I like the shoes than more bucks. than $100. Yeah. So uh, how much more? Well, nobody kind of, people are vague about that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to a, an auction market, uh, a so-called English or buyer's bid market, what happens? The prices start out low, and there's lots and lots of bidders. The prices rise, and people drop out, and there's only one left, and the item is, is awarded to that person. That tells you right away the law of demand, that people have maximum amounts they're willing to pay that they discover, they mm -hmm. find out. So we just created that in, in this, uh, uh, the classroom, and I had them just shout out bids and asks, and they traded. And, and then I repeated it Monday, Tuesday. You imagine uh, a, da a daily market. These would last about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Prices converged to the competitive equilibrium, the intersection of the supply and demand. Equilibrium. And I was astonished. So, uh, you got to remember, you have to remember that my mother was a socialist and had a Harvard education. Mm -hmm. I wasn't prepared to see markets work that well. So I thought, well, you know, I keep trying this. Maybe it was an accident. 
turned out, no matter what the configurations of supply and demand, they would find the equilibrium, and they had no idea what it was they were finding. Right. They had no idea that they w were not leaving money on the table. So basically, you found with students who are completely ignorant of economics, yep. ignorant of everything except their own cost or their own value, let them swap, and they found their way to exactly what economists would and say. And then it changed my life. Wow. I never saw economics in the same way, and I stayed with experimental economics. Uh, that first experiment was done in January 1956. My first paper was published on that topic in the Journal of Political Economy in 1962. 63, I taught the first uh, work, uh, seminar in experimental economics at Purdue, and of course people didn't even know what experimental economics mm -hmm. was. And it's just been a it's been a, a blast. My a my blast career, and a, an amazing career doing this. Yeah. So you have a, a book coming out on housing bubbles now. Yes. And, and you actually this is your 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 prior book yes. here, Rationality but, and Economics. But here's the thing, Ben. I started following. Oh, I should say. I believed then, from the 60s clear up into, oh, about, about 1982-83, I had the idea, the misperception that all markets worked as effectively as those. Okay. Then, starting in 82-83, Arlington Williams and I, a graduate student, we thought, well, let's, let, we haven't done, no one's done any experiments with asset trading. Mm -hmm. where you can buy and resell an asset, and the asset yields, gets, get, yields some sort of utility, like a dividend. Mm -hmm. But you, uh, let's, see if, let's, do, let's see if we can design some experiments. We'll start with a real simple, transparent environment that they'll trade at fundamental value, and then we'll see if we can create bubbles. That was our idea. Mm -hmm. We started with an environment where people had complete information, and we reminded them each period what the fundamental value was. They paid no attention to that. They still created we bubbles sometimes. We got bubbles. And we, so the question became not how do you create bubbles, but how do you make them go away? Uh -huh. <laughs> so we, or the we, things that make bubbles more likely. Or money. More, so if you yeah. inject money into it, you get you more give, bubbles. If I take two groups here with exactly the same parameters except this group, I give more cash relative to the value of shares in that system, and this less cash relative to the value of shares. This group will give me a larger bubble, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can replicate that experiment. Bring people back a second time and let them trade in the same environment. The bubble is not, it's still there, but it's not quite as big, and it doesn't have as much volume. Bring them back a third time, and they finally get it. Mm -hmm. They don't get there by thinking about it. They get there by experience. Right. The market's a discovery process, and yes. they're having to grope their way through this. To, so to what I learned, I realized that there's a really big difference between these two kinds of markets. What I didn't fully realize until I started following the Great Recession. And the Great prepared, Recession, this most recent contraction the most, we've had. Yes. I started doing and, and 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 started to work on that. And, and the whole question of housing bubbles, I realized that the, in the national income accounts, there is one category of uh, output that's extremely stable. It's called non-durable consumer goods. And moreover, it's big. It's by far the largest. This is the stuff we buy in our daily lives. It's hamburgers, awesome. it's yeah. haircuts. When you buy a ticket on an airline, when you rent mm -hmm. a hotel room, you are you are buying something that is perishes when you consume it, and you can't retrade it. That and I realized it struck me. Wait a minute. Of course, all of those original experiments I did, those were perishables. The uh, and then as soon as you can retrade something, and at last you got trouble instability. So uh, what I say now is it's. If you take GNP, GDP and subtract government expenditures. So the private sector that's of the, the economy. That's private, the total private product. Uh, Non-durable consumer goods are 75% of that. 
But most of the instability in the economy comes from the other 25. You never have a problem with that 75. It really behaves itself. Markets work unbelievably well. So our latest Great Recession then you're going to attribute to the uh, housing bubble that occurred in that market? In particular, housing, what was kind of, people generally know that who've been through this because they followed the, the newspapers. Well, it everything. seems like that, but it, it's bizarre to me that everybody seems to appreciate that there was a housing bubble, but then the government keeps trying to prop up the housing and related industries. Oh, well, but, you know, uh, people are recognized that the problem was too much stimulus of housing. Mm -hmm. So what's the solution? More what's stimulus the, of housing. Yeah. So this, what, what the problem became the solution. <laughs> And it can't be right. So what do you it, think a better solution is? Well, I think the, the, the major mistake, major error we made was what people is popularly known as the too big to fail. Mm -hmm. You see, the large banks, the, very, the largest behemoth banks were uh, bailed out by action of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. What they did, as, as soon as housing values started to fall, all kinds of people uh, found themselves in homes that were worth less than what you could get for the home. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, they owed on their home more than what they could get for their home. Mm -hmm. So a lot, large number of homes were in neg what we call negative ac equity. Their assets were below what they owed. Uh, the banks are on the other side of that. So they basically have a negative equity problem too. And when banks are like that, they don't lend. They hunker down, mm -hmm. just as households hunker down to don't spend. You try to reduce debt. And it's very important in that process that banks that are in neg ec negative equity go through a bankruptcy and failure process. Now, we, didn't, we did that for, with over 400 banks, small to medium-sized banks. They didn't right. get a lot of publicity. But a lot of regional and smaller banks, and, and they're the, often the ones that are in commercial real estate. So it's the smaller, the community banks yes. did a better restructure. They went through and were restructured. They came out whole, much more ready to lend because their balance sheets were cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And that's very important in a capitalist system. So, you know, a lot of people, when they hear bankruptcy, though, they think of, you know, personally, if someone goes through bankruptcy, it's traumatic, and it's got to just be bad for the economy. But, you know, we had too many resources go into housing and mortgage lending, other related industries. We don't have to burn the houses or shoot the people who went to the wrong places, right? It's a, right, a right. reallocation process. Well, houses just have to be priced. To, uh, f the price falls until they clear the market and people start to... And, and we've had a fair amount of that, you know, about a third of the homes recently, in the last couple of three years, people are paying cash for them. Yeah, so really the recipe here is, is not reflating this, this bubble, but it's, it's painful, we went through it, but we have to reallocate asset titles and then we can go forward and hopefully grow more rapidly. Well, there's no solution that's not painful. If, if you wanna avoid the pain, you gotta avoid that situation in the first place, because once you're there, there's no uh, simple and easy way out. And an important part of the process is that incumbent investors who have lost money, they made their bets and they lost, they take their hit. Mm -hmm. And then that gives that system a chance to, 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 uh, to be jump-started into a new growth. Well, thank you for, for visiting with us today. You've, you've heard it here. It's unfortunately we get into these, one of these bubbles, but there's no easy way out. We need the markets process to clear up these bad investments and let us go forward. Uh, thank you for joining us. Okay. So on today's episode, we talked about energy markets and Enron and then housing bubbles. And these things don't seem like they go together, but in some ways they kind of do. If you actually think about the Enron scandal, a lot of people just blamed it on greed. And in this latest housing bubble, when everybody was betting on the market going up, they said greed is driving it, greed is the problem. But greed's constant. It's always around. It can't explain Enron, and it can't explain housing bubbles. You need something to change to be able to talk about why something else changed in the real world, not something like greed that's constant. Greed can be good when it's harnessed through market forces and you have to voluntarily serve other people. But in the case of Enron, when that greed can be crony capitalism, that can distort markets and lead to bad outcomes. Similarly, in the housing bubble, when that greed is socializing the risk so that 
banks and other investors can put their losses on the taxpayers while privatizing their rewards, that's crony capitalism too, and that doesn't work well either. Thanks for joining us today.